still something like there he is you see him Tamara mm -hmm, okay. there he is. can you guys see my camera no we can just see you your name you're on here twice though for some reason yeah, because I was on my cell phone one too, and it and it came in at the same time. But I don't know why my camera here is. Um, join us, panelists. There you are. There now, man. Oh, look, you, oh look, you work at Modot now. Yeah, that's that? where I'm at now. All right, we're getting you guys loaded up. Thank goodness this worked. So we are live now, just so you guys are aware, but we're, we're just going to start at 11. We'll just... We are also on Facebook, so FYI. Okay. You guys got to have to go powder your noses. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that already. What's funny is actually I brought my old uh, TV makeup with me because I don't know if anybody can tell. I have a big bruise on my forehead because I dropped 225 pounds on my forehead on my last rep of bench pressing 225 and I didn't make it. And I, I was wow. working out. Wow. Home, wow. home gym, no spotter. Uh, you're lucky you didn't kill yourself. yourself. No, yeah. I, I was I was trying to bail because I had spotter arms and I was trying to bail in time. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. I could have cracked my teeth, smashed my face, mm. black eye, but it got me right up here. So I did bring my makeup, Renny. You'll love that, and and Vinny because <laughs> I found my old makeup bag. <laughs> Man, I'm really lucky. I, I mean, in all seriousness, I was like, wow, could have been a lot worse. It could have. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else drop a barbell on their head? You want to share? Renny, have you ever <laughs> dropped one? Not recently. <laughs> and my chiropractor keeps telling me, stop trying to bench press and deadlift and squat as much. You're in your, you're in your 50s. It's not the same anymore. True. True. And you would, think a chiropractor, you would think a chiropractor wouldn't care because he would want you, you know, to get injured and come see him and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it depends what type of patient you are. If you're one of those patients that you don't want to deal with, like, eh, let me let me make sure this guy stays healthy. Oh, no, I'm a good patient. I, I'm, one, I'm one of those men that likes to go to the doctor if I have to. Yeah. I don't want to wait, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, I, I need to go to chiropractor this week at some point to see what's going on with my back. I, I guess my hips, my hips feel un, out of line. Yeah, uh, was, uh, that's, that could be an IT thing. But John Smith, he's a chiropractor over in Ellsville, Clarkson, Clayton Road. He's the best. Okay. Is I've he got really? One that we yes. go to. I just went to see a sports at, um, a sports chiropractor, and he helped me out over off of Ballas. Mm -hmm. So he is a fine one. Doesn't want you to come back. That's the key. Uh, yeah, well, he kicked me over to the, somebody that's, else. So. Well, the, no, so the key is to find the one that doesn't want you to come back. To me, that's kind of like, you know, beat you up in the first <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what you want. <laughs> Turns out mine wasn't really a, a, a skeletal issue. It was a muscular issue, so. <laughs> 60 seconds. And then hopefully we'll get... things moving i will give it a couple of i will give it like a minute or two before i make the introduction of the webinar to give people time to start loading in so no worries on jumping in immediately and responding
you guys should be used to the voice of God in your ear without seeing that face, those individuals. So just know that <laughs> this is God speaking to you. <laughs> God is a woman. Betty, what do you think? <laughs> Oh, I have a Lord. picture out there. We're looking at the silhouette. God is a woman. <laughs> <laughs> is that the new stuff? Look at this guy here. Avoiding guys with bombs in Washington, D.C. <laughs> huh? Wasn't that you, Mr. Blanton? Oh, yeah. I was like, why? What do you, why? Why? you act like, what? It was like two days ago what happened. And Holden hit my Twitter. I was like, Holden, I don't want to do that. Oh, I, I said, oh, I embrace your uh, innovation, yeah. I embrace your hustle. I can do it if it's a both side. And he was yeah. like, yeah. I said, okay, I'm giving you two bites. That way I know you can't do a package. And he kept on, <laughs> I, like, I said, hold it, it better not be a package. I don't that's, care that's what not that right. is. That's not right. You know the trials and the tribulations of the media trying to get a story done. And you try to hold out on it. Man, if I had known this the other day when I tossed to that story, I would have said something. Let me take something about that guy. <laughs> like he probably planted the bomb. Well, you know, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, I wake up that morning and I see Vinny on, and I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And he was texting me the whole time it was going on. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah. It's called, it's called another day in DC. You just can't stay off TV. <laughs> right. And that's what everybody, they said, of course, you're in the middle of the action. Every mm -hmm. time you go from where something national happens. <laughs> It's like you sniffed it out. But uh, hey, Ray, <laughs> going on? remember when we were in D.C. and the sniper stuff was going on? I was leaving I? Quantico every day wow. in my uniform when I get the, uh, to the station. They're like, where yeah. were you? I said, I promise it wasn't me. I know. Uh -oh. I know. Yeah, you can't see me, Ben. You can hear me, though. I told you. I am the voice of God. We need a picture. <laughs> <laughs> getting scary out here that's, that's right. horrible. but yeah Holden has hustle I'm like man okay it's 11 o'clock guys I'm going to start preparing for the intro I was just told. I just. I was just told we're live on Facebook. Everybody, you like my background? What are you, Chicago Cubs? Yeah, the, the team, the team that got sold. <laughs> sold or sold out? Sold. <laughs> I don't have a background. This is my office, but there's no background. It's just that's it. <laughs> you see, I sit way back. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, but we're all separated. You know, there there is no 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 desk next to another desk. At least not with people sitting at the same time in the same places. <laughs> Where are you, Rennie? Are you you guys all got your own cubicles now? Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're I mean they're separated with plexiglass, and really, depending on what hours you work, there's no more than one person around you. Oh, that's kind of cool. Kinda. Kind of, but at the oh. same time, it's it's different, you know. There's there's like there really seems like there's nobody here, but they're way on the other side of the room. So I get to talk it. I could talk without uh, have put headphones on. Or wearing a mask, apparently. If I get up, I have to put one on. I've oh, got gotcha. stuff. So I, I can go with the, the paper one. I can go with the uh, cloth one. And then I have, I don't know where it is. I have a KN95 too, or a couple of them actually. <laughs> Very well protected from all germs in the area. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> the paper mask, the cloth mask. Not to mention. 
Lysol, there you go. You got the spray? I got, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> All right. Oh, by the way, the, the economy size hand sterilizer. Oh, and I'm wow. the only one that sits here. So I just, I wipe everything down constantly. I got all that same stuff at my desk too, but I'm not in my desk. I'm uh, I'm in the conference room where the MoDOT sign is. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing a package while we're doing this. Um, my day is all discombobulated. Normally what I would have done yesterday, I'm doing now. All right, guys, thank you for joining the St. Louis chapter in this mid-afternoon webinar. The vision of this panel is to speak with several men of color to discuss the topic centered around being of man of color in the room during corporate and private communications, as well as uh, additional social media aspects of the industry. A moderated discussion with Sean Hadley with Q&A sessions throughout will be held with the hopes of encouraging and strengthening other men of color within the area of communications. Sean Hadley, I'll turn it over to you. I'm Sean Hadley. I'm the current president of PRSA and also serve as a manager of public affairs for the Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District. This uh, panel is kind of a little near and dear to my heart because I'm seeing some old friends and uh, colleagues and um, some new colleagues that I work with now as well. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to dive right into this and I'm going to go ahead and just go from uh, from my left to right from who I see and have them give, give a quick introduction of who they are. Um, first, I'm going to go with Rennie Knott. Well, my name is Rennie Knott. I am the uh, morning news anchor at KCK News Channel 5 in St. Louis. Uh, prior to this, I was the sports director here starting in 2004 to 2016 when I switched to the desk. This is my 34th year overall in broadcasting, uh, beginning my career back in 1987 in uh, Medford, Oregon at uh, KDRV, then eventually going to Mobile, Alabama, and then to Washington, D.C., and then here. So it has been a, um, a nice eye-opening experience to the lifestyles of the United States from four different regions. And trust me, as much as people are different, a lot of things are the same in many of those places. And I'm sure that as we go through this morning, we'll go through some of those differences and some of the similarities uh, that we see and why I think it's affecting the world today. Thanks, Ray. I'm gonna go with Marco next, Marco Ramirez. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Marco Ramirez. I'm currently the public engagement coordinator with Excel Business Concepts. I'm the PRSSA treasurer and I'm also a SLU graduate student. Previous, uh, previously in the summer, I worked for Twitter. Um, I was their communications intern. And yeah, um, I love this field of communication. Thanks, Marco. I'm gonna go with uh, Jack Wang. Good morning, everybody. And as Sean mentioned, uh, it is good to see a lot of familiar faces, both new faces and some uh, old faces. Um, I am the president-elect next year for the PRSA St. Louis chapter. I currently work in, in senior communications at MoDOT St. Louis in the St. Louis district. Uh, but prior to that, I spent 14 years working in broadcasting, much as Rennie mentioned earlier, in various markets around um, the U.S. I was very fortunate um, to start my career in the Midwest in Sioux City, Iowa, and pretty much stayed in the Midwest for the uh, Pretty much all my career working in uh, Iowa, Nebraska, and then eventually in Springfield and in St. Louis, Missouri, and then uh, worked at KSDK alongside Rennie and Sean. Um, and once I left, I went into uh, communications and public relations and have worked in a variety of industries over the past decade or so, including transportation, including education, nonprofit, state government. Um, I've even worked on a nonpartisan uh, campaign, a uh, ballot initiative. And so I, I've done a lot of different things. And I think all of that has been very helpful um, throughout my career. And, and, you know, please have any, if you have any questions about any of those industries that I've worked in or um, how I can be of help, please let me know. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jack. And last but certainly not least, we're going to go with uh, my man, Vinton Blandon. 
Yeah, so the name is Vincent Blandon. I'm in the 28th uh, year in the field of communications, but more specifically the PR side. It's only about a year, but uh, before uh, this role of communications director at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in St. Louis, it was a reporter, uh, most recently at KMOV TV. And thank you, then. And again, like I said, my name is Sean Hadley, and um, I'm going to reintroduce myself. We're going to dive right into this, though. So, this, dis this panel discussion is open ended. We want to we have questions. We want to, um, we'll, this is going to be an open, open engagement, open conversation between everybody here. We also want the, uh, everyone that's attending to go ahead and enter your question in the chat. Uh, we're also live on Facebook. If you have questions there, you can put, you know, this as well. And we'll, we will certainly address those questions as we go through this. So, um, the first question I'm going to go through, and Rennie and, uh, kind of touched on this a little bit. How did you get to where, you are today. Talk about your journey and what you what you've gone through. And I'll actually go to Rennie on this one first. Um, you know, just out of respect, Rennie's actually got more experience than all of us. <laughs> Is that out of respect for the gray hair or out of the fact? I didn't say that. You know, it's like, you know, you know, always respect your elders, but I didn't say that. You know, anyway, but uh, no, but um, we'll start with Rennie here because Rennie's Rennie and I have known each other for years, but uh, Rennie's mm -hmm. Rennie and everybody here has a story to tell, but. Uh, Rennie's journey will, will, I think, transition all of us into where we are because we all are connected to, to one anotherness um, in, in some aspects. So, Rennie, just go ahead and talk about you. You know, you, you played football in college, started mm -hmm. out in Medford, Oregon, and yeah. um, went from there. Can you just talk about being in those regions and what you went through? Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and then I went to Southern Oregon State College, which is in Ashland, Oregon, um, probably about 15 miles north of the state border of California between the two. And um, I played football there, had a nice football career. I thought, oh man, the NFL is gonna be there for me. Not so much. Uh, it was a good thing that I buckled down and started to do my homework and study in class and get my education. So I started at KDRB TV in Medford, Oregon. I was actually hired before I finished college because as an intern at um, the, uh, the CBS affiliate in, in Medford, I actually got to be on the air and anchored a little bit. And then I took the job over there before um, I got out of college. So I started in the December of 87 and worked there for about two years. Um, I eventually ended up in Mobile, Alabama at WJLA TV. They hired me from uh, Medford and it was, it was great. It was a fun place to be. It was different because you grew up in LA where everything goes. You go to Oregon where it's very organic. And then you go to Mobile, Alabama, where it's the deep, deep South. And I wasn't quite ready for that, but I adapted and I learned. I learned a lot about how to handle people, how to handle tough situations, how to diffuse things, and then how to get build up a trust with people that you think would never, ever trust you. I was in Mobile for probably three years, a little bit less than three years. And then in 1991, 92, I got hired by WALA which is the ABC affiliate in Washington, D.C. at the time. I was hired to be the weekend sports anchor, and I had that job for about three months. Then I was promoted to the main sports anchor. I held that position there for 12 years uh, before coming here in 2004. Um, the interesting thing about Washington, D.C. is that it's a melting pot for all these different places and all these different people. But at the same time, it's a melting pot for all these ideals and the way people look and think about one another. And so you do have these groups that you now see on social media where people are like-minded and they pull apart and it's trying to bring people together for a greater good. That's not always easy to do, but when you do sports, it is because that is that common ground that people can stand on together and cheer side by side, no matter what their income is, what their race is, what the religion is. Come here to St. Louis, very different place. St. Louis to me is a mix of all those other places, but a little bit more blatant and in your face. I think some of the things that I experienced here were things that I can't believe that person just said that. I can't believe that person just contacted me in that way. Um, it's almost in the beginning, a little bit of disrespect. But then over time, I understood that when you're not from here, people view you as an outsider and you're more put off guard because you're not from here. So people can't pigeonhole you or understand all your background and everything else because you don't know where I went to high school. Um, but after being here for a while and raising my family here, I really do like St. Louis. And I do think that St. Louis is starting to change and adapt to the real world. It's just a slow process, um, but we have to be patient. 
So my story is bouncing around the country. I have a better appreciation for people and why people grow up the way they do and act the way they do. And a lot of it is fear. A lot of it is lack of knowledge. But if we can knock down those fears and get to understand one another, you can view me the way you want to view me because that's your own prerogative. But I do think that you should respect me. And I do think that everybody's be respected in some form or another. And, you know, you brought up a good point with the, uh, the high school question. So mm -hmm. I want to touch on that real fast here. And, and Jack, I know you probably can add to this as well, but that is a St. Louis thing. Um, me being, I'm not from St. Louis as well. I mean, I'm, I'm a Midwestern, but I'm not from St. Louis. But that was one thing that I noticed when you come here, right off the bat, it's what high school you go to. And it's kind of what I, what I found out about that over the years is that they, that's how they put you in your category in St. Mm -hmm. Louis. And that's kind of one mm -hmm. of the things where we always talk about categories here. Jack, I mean, explain, I mean, you're, you're from here and you, you, I mean, you, you grew up here and everything, um, work in this market, work in other markets, but talk about your journey too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would concur a lot with what Rennie said, but definitely the, the, whole, the high school question that we all kind of laugh and joke about here in St. Louis that you get. But when, when people ask you that question, they're in essence, as you said, pigeonholing you, but also in basically one answer that you give, which is what high school or what school district did you graduate from, it kind of gives that person who asks you the question everything they need to know about your social economic background, meaning what school district did you go to? Did you go to a suburban school district? Did you go to an urban school district? Did you go to a rural school district? Did you go to a rich school district? All that type of thing. And I can tell you, having also worked for a school district working in PR, you know, it's one of those questions that you kind of get and you're like, well, what are you trying to get at? I think that the bottom line is, and one of the things I've been real thankful about is during my journey, having worked in television for 14 years, and I worked and I started in Sioux City, Iowa, TCAU, the ABC affiliate there. And then from there went on to Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, you know, the... Uh, KOLN, the, the, the CBS affiliate, and then ended up in Springfield, Missouri, and then came eventually St. Louis at KSDK. Again, like I said, even though I was pretty fortunate to stay in the Midwest, again, everywhere I went, you know, I experienced different people, different backgrounds. And so for me, I always felt like, you know what, I can get along with just about anybody. And I think one of the important things I learned is that you have to be true to yourself because especially when you were working in TV, if that viewer didn't like you, they could turn the channel and turn you off. And so for me, it was all about um, working hard to, uh, to gain their respect, which is kind of what Rennie was talking about. Because, you know, from that end, I knew it was all about viewership. You know, if they saw you out in the streets and they would greet you uh, kindly, you know, that's great. But I do also remember too, a lot of instances where I would get the, the not the high school question, especially working in other markets, but I would get the question about, oh, were you born here or where are you from? Because, you know, the next thing they always say to me is, hey, I don't hear an accent when I hear you speak. And, you know, at the time I wasn't taken aback by it, but as I get older, I start thinking more about, okay, maybe some of those folks didn't mean it in a derogatory sense, but, you know, I mean, we're all humans. We're all, we're all here and we're all here for a short time. And so let's all just have some commonality rather than saying, hey, and I get the curiosity part of it too, but I think there's a better way to phrase that um, than just saying, hey, you don't have an accent. Where are you from? Yeah. And, you know, there's one thing I'm going to hit on with you in a minute, Jack, and because um, you have a good, you have a good, a good insight on this. And, um, and this is probably about the time Rennie came to this market too, is that St. Louis, so we're going to talk about St. Louis for a minute. St. Louis had at one point, they have a big trend in TV and we kind of, you and I kind of joked about this still in the past and everything like that, how at one point in like mid two thousands, the Asians were a hot commodity in St. Louis. Everybody, every station had to have an Asian. And I'm going to touch on that just here in a minute, but I want to go to Vinny. I want Vinny to kind of talk about Vinny's journey. Cause Vinny's got a little bit of uniqueness here because uh, Vinny does have a military background as well and where he came from and how he got to where he, where, where we are. So Cool. So uh, where I came from, Chicago, Illinois, where I went after that was South Carolina. And then from there, I went into the United States Marine Corps, uh, stationed overseas, uh, the Pacific Rim, all uh, Korea, Japan, Australia, all that. Then I ended up at headquarters Marine Corps in D.C. 
And then after that uh, time, I went into television. I uh, worked at the NBC station in Washington, and that's where I became familiar with the Randy Dodd when he was over at Channel 7. Then I went to Baltimore, worked there then. From there, I went from that area down to the south again, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Then I went to uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Huntsville, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, all that, St. Louis, and I think I missed a couple of markets in between. So when you uh, hear about people moving all over, he was in four regions. My uh, background and my experience and context comes from different areas of the country, things overseas, different uh, communities like that. Uh, Yankee, Southern, you know, they look at me like, oh, you're one of them. Everywhere I go, it's like, oh, you're one of them. It's like, wow. So that's a diverse background there. But how I ended up at the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, just working in television, and uh, somebody wanted to talk to me about joining the office, and here we are. Okay. And, you know, again, Vinny's, Vinny's journey was more Midwest to East Coast to South. Um, you know, Marco, I'm going to bring you in here now, too. Um, Marco's, uh, Marco's our, our young in this whole group, and uh, he's actually fresh to the business and everything. But Marco's actually from Arkansas. And so I want Marco to talk about being Hispanic and kind of coming through that time and coming up to where you are now. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I had experienced growing up was the fact that a lot of the like icons and anchors on the news were very much white. Um, and it was very white driven all throughout my time. And when I got into the field of PR, I couldn't really relate to any of the agencies in Arkansas because um, they were primarily white. And so I just didn't feel like I would fit in. But when I came to St. Louis, I saw more opportunities and more agencies that kind of catered to what I was looking for when it comes to um, getting involved with diversity and inclusion. And so that's why I got into Excel Business Concepts because um, like Crystal Allen Dallas is a woman of color, Black, and she was able to really um, drive this dream of hers and create a business um, in the field of marketing and PR. So um, yeah, that's one of the things that I do respect. Um, and I see all the little troubles when it comes to like the anchors and having a, a team that's not very diverse or inclusive. Okay. So I, I touched on this a minute ago, but I really want to I really want to dive in and really like hey, Sean. hear. Yes. Sean. Yes. I want to just rewind for a second with something Marco said, which I, I think is very important, um, is that you need to see you. In other words, I, when I turn on the television, I need to see people like me to have a better understanding that they understand me and they have an idea of what I have gone through and the things that I face every day. That is something that you coming up in this business, I did not see a lot of. In Medford, I was the first Black person on TV. In Mobile, I wasn't the first Black person on TV, but one of few. Um, when I was in Washington, D.C., I was told, and I don't know if this is fact, that I was the first Black sports director, um, you know, Monday through Friday sports anchor in the market, and I got there in the 90s. So when you don't see people like you, your idea becomes, I can't be that. That is something that I can't obtain. Um, people can say all the time, oh, you can be whatever you want. But until I see somebody who's like me, that reflects me, I don't necessarily think I could be there. At the same time, I think it builds up a trust in your community when you see people like yourself. He goes, well, that guy knows what I've gone through. That person has walked in my shoes at some point or another in their lifetime. And I think that's one of the things that we're missing in today's media. And we're seeing, we're seeing a growth. But it's almost been a forced growth that if we don't get with it, people are going to turn us off because they don't see themselves out there. And, and I think that that is opening doors, one, to people who want to do this, and two, opening the door to young minds to think, hey, you know what, that could be a career for me one day because, look, there's guys like me doing it. You're exactly right, um, Rennie. And here's, I'm going to add to this. Um, Rennie and I did work together at, uh, at, at KSDK years ago. I was, I was actually behind the scenes. I was a producer, um, Simon editor. And I will tell you what Rennie is saying is very, very true as, a, as opposed to coming up into this. I mean, I came out of college in 2001 and came to KSDK and I was the only person of color in an editorial decision-making role in that newsroom. One of the top stations in the country. 
and I was the only editorial person. And I and I would speak up at times because I was a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. I'd go to different conferences and I and I asked the question of the people of, of senior management at KSDK, why don't we have more producers? Why don't we have more producers of color? Why don't we have more people? Who, well, you know, you know what the what the answer to that was. Well, there's just there's just there's just nobody out there that that's that that, that wants these jobs. And I'm like. That is totally not true. When you go to when and Vinny can speak on this too. When you go to NABJ, that is the only place that we can go as a person of color, black, Asian, Hispanic as well too. That you can actually get. You're the only person they're seeing. You're not facing your white counterpart. They are there. These companies are there looking for black people, Asians, you know, Hispanic. Um, you know, whatever, whatever race you want to say, they're there looking for that only. And that's the only time I could tell you that I didn't feel any pressure from having to do more than I'll just say my white counterpart, period. And he, everybody jump in on this. I mean, chime in on your own experiences, but that's just one thing I experienced there. And I told, I, t- I touched on the, on the Asian thing with Jack a minute ago, because that was a true fact. There was, I remember sitting in the newsroom at KSDK, Channel 4 had an Asian reporter. Now we had to get one. No, we, we didn't have to just get one. We got two. Yep. We had a female and a male. Yep. And then, yep. you know, when you look at, you know, the other stations followed suit. It was like one of the hot commodities at the time. And then it wasn't hot anymore. Yeah. Now you look around and it's like, now you look around and the teams and Rennie can, <laughs> the, the picking you a little bit, you got the, the white black anchor now. You know, that whole combination to either black, black male, white female, white, you know, white male, black female. So you just look at that whole combination of what's going on here. And how the transitions made even when you look at commercials now on tv you know my my uh somebody here told me they'll never see another white person never seen a person like them they're talking white on a commercial like again just mm-hmm. you know you'll never see that you always see a diverse commercial so mm-hmm. go ahead and touch on this let's just let's let's open it up let's go well yeah, but there I, should you shouldn't have to worry about there being a, a diverse look on television because when i walk out the door and i walk down market street i see a diverse st louis i see a diverse missouri a diverse America. And until we start to, to understand that, that this is the real world that I'm in, how are we going to make proper advancements? You know, I remember when, when Michael Brown was shot and killed and, you know, the things that people were saying and this, that, and the other. And I thought, well, do you really know what it's like to be a black man in America? Do you really know what it's like when you're driving home after working and get the front neck and get pulled over for doing nothing other than driving a Mercedes Benz? And then the person goes, I just wanted to make sure it was you. Like, what does that mean? So things like this actually do happen. And unless there's a voice within the room, then it's silence. And so it's, it's one of these things that you've got to start forcing your way inside, not physically forcing your way inside, but actually saying, I need to be other than an on-air person. I need to be among the people who are making decisions as to what we cover and how we cover and if we're being fair. One of the things that I find um, that is missing is that there's not a lot of people who know their history. They know what happened yesterday. They know what happened last year, but they don't know the history behind why there's the BLM movement, why there has been this, you know, outrage of why don't you understand me? Because all they know, at least a lot of them only know, well, gosh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. Next thing I know, Barack Obama's president. So there you go. Everything is grand and it isn't. That's why I have to say, I really, when I work in, uh, in public relations for an urban school district here in St. Louis, I really love doing that job because there it was an opportunity where the vast student body was, uh, was African-American. And so for them, it was a chance for them to interact with me just as much as I interacted with them. Now, of course, I had been around, you know, for example, African-Americans my entire life. I mean, I grew up playing football with some of some of my best friends are black, you know, growing up in, in, in all of that. So but for them at that point, it was an opportunity for young black Americans to see this Asian man walk into their school. Yeah, I was dressed up because back then we had to wear suits, but nevertheless, they got to see someone and they got to talk and interact with someone that was completely different from them. And I think that was very beneficial. So even as Rennie was talking about with the Michael Brown situation, that that touched me and that affected me because, you know, I saw and heard all the struggles that my African-American friends had gone through previously. And I was well aware of that. 
I mean, that's even happened to me where I've been pulled over just because I was driving a fancy sports car uh, and, and, and they just wanted to check because, and they told me in my case, Renny, they stopped me because they thought I was a drug dealer because I was dressed mm. too nice and driving a nice sports car. And this was in an affluent uh, West County suburb. So, and to talk about Sean's fact earlier, yeah, that's correct. I mean, when I joined KSDK, I was uh, one of two Asian reporters on the air, and my colleague was was a female uh, Asian reporter. And it was it was unique at that time that there was two at the same time. But since we both left, there haven't been any. Uh, and I'm not trying to single out KSDK or KMOV or anyone, but you know, we have a diverse population out there in, in St. Louis. And I think regardless of whether it's in television or in any industry, you've got to have that diversity and inclusion and equality, I think, in your workforce, regardless of what industry it is, because it's got to match what, what you see, as Rennie was saying, when you walk out the door on Market Street. Yeah, and, you know, Vinny and I have had these conversations in the off, I mean, several times just in in passing with regards to where I'm at in my role and with regards to where um, Vinny's at in his role, you can count, I mean, no joke, you can count on maybe two hands, probably I'm going to say one, how many Black men are in these positions of in the public relations side of it? You know, I'm the senior management here, but just in general, how many Black men hold these type of positions? In, on, the, on the PR and the public relations side of it. I mean, a break in over here was not an easy, was not an easy fix. I mean, Vinny and I had got a long conversation about him breaking in over here. I mean, not even breaking in, they came to get him and he didn't want to come. But I said, you know, you need to, you need to rethink that because it's very rare that that happens. And very, very rare that, that that's something that, that takes place. I mean, you know, um, and, and I'll, I'll yield to Vinny on this one. Let him, you know, let him, let him you know, take off on it. Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and say that that was a challenge. Um, you know, I had been in this bubble of working in television for uh, more than uh, two decades. So I was like, wow, we fight, we advocate, we do this. Yeah, we're getting there. It's in style to be Black. It's in style to be Asian. Oh, now the white man is calling. The white office is calling. This agency is calling. Oh, this is cool. Let's take this job. So the job, I'm the only black guy, you know, in that role, uh, in that on that floor, in that position, if you will. Now there are other black supervisors. Well, we have one black supervisor, but those are the things that you have to think about. But I want to touch on television part because I have more time in that field than in this field. What Randy talked about, you know, we need to see that if you don't have that voice in the room, the room is silent. And there's a company now that's talking to me. I tried to get me to come into management. It's a broadcasting company. Don't want to say the names yet because I don't know if it's factual, but I did some research talking to other people who work in that major company. And they have six male managers who are Black. That's two at corporate and four at their 60 stations. Now, when it comes to Black women, they have tons. When it comes to Asians, they have a few. But that, that shook me. I was like, oh my God, you don't even have one at 1% 1 of the local stations, but you have two at your corporate office. So the struggle is real out there. I mean, I think when we are people of color, I don't know about the audience, but as for the panelists, I think when we are people of color, we don't always see it. I think we know it, we feel it, but we have learned to put up that facade, put up the uh, wall to just say, hey, I'm doing my job, I'm dealing with it, I'm loyal, but it's a real problem. So I think it needs to be done. I think, you know, I fight a lot for diversity with NABJ and uh, I always tell newsrooms, I was very vocal at Kim Ovi and I still talk to them now. It's like diversity is not just the color thing, black and white. It's black, white, gay, straight, young, old, country mouse, city mouse, educated by college, military, you know, I have college and military, but Diversity, the true essence of diversity is, you know, for my take, is just having a well-rounded representation of the community around you. So that's my take on diversity. And, and you're and you're you're taking diversity is actually, I mean, it's accurate. I mean, it's 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 by interpretation, obviously. But you look at right now what's going on when when George Floyd happened, and all these companies started to get what we call what to say they started to get woke and they started to say, okay, we need to we need to figure out what to do here. Diversity and inclusion is a new hot button, the new hot topic, the new um, 
the new position. But if you look at it, you look around on, I mean, you look around on social media, you look around on like on different platforms, you'd see every, every so often, you'd always see a black person, and I'll say mainly a black female getting promoted to a diversity and inclusion position. And it was like, oh, you'd see, you rarely see an Asian. Um, you, we just, I mean, Mark, we just got a, uh, coming into Mizzou, we just got a, a, a Latino athletic director coming in there, female. Um, and but I mean you're starting to see this little breakthroughs of, of little things happening, and to me that's 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 kind of putting a um, putting a bandaid on a situation that's been there. I mean you can't just put well, somebody. But but see I would disagree with the bandaid on the situation. What what I look at it as is the beginning of something new. You know someone has to be that first person that pioneer, and we as much as we want change, this is still business. It is still dollars and cents of corporate and all those things. So they're probably looking at it as, all right, so let's begin it. If this person lives up to the job, we're going to give another person a chance and another person a chance. That is one of the pressures about being a person of color is that when you're the first one through the door, you have a lot of people behind you that if I don't set the proper example, that door's not going to open for them too. So I see these people getting these positions. I'm not going to look at it as, yo, what took so long? I'm like, hey, all right, here we go. Here we go. Now you go get it done. And the next person is going to say, hey, I could do that too and, and keep it rolling. But yeah, there was a time when these doors would never, ever open. But those doors were open only to a very select few. And that select few was white men. And now the doors, I would say, since really the, the 70s seem to have been pried open more and more and more. And we're starting to see more people of color who are able to branch out on their own and make their own headways in business and not rely on somebody else to help them get through, but to be beat their own path. You know, you look at Dave Stewart here, we're worldwide technology. You know, unless you've seen him in the last couple of years, you probably didn't know it was a black man in charge of that business because he kept it quiet. Well, there's a lot of people of color who are doing great things and making America move that you never hear of because they stay low key. And when I go and I, I speak at the Royal Vagabonds, they're a group of uh, black men, black businessmen in the area, well-to-do. And I say to them, you have got to let your light shine. If your light doesn't shine and other people don't see it, how are they gonna know it's even possible? And so whenever the case comes up where I can go talk and, and see young people, I like to go do it because I want them to know that the possibility is indeed there, but someone has to be the first one through the door. We can't all say, open it up, we should all be here. We're gonna see those quote unquote tokens here and there until more people decide that they wanna do it too. My brother coaches in the NFL. And you know, at a time when he first started, he's a year younger than me, 56, there were very few black coaches on the sidelines. But now there's a lot of black coaches on the sidelines. That's because they started to see, you know what? These guys do know what they're doing. Oh, right, well, that's some more in. Come on guys, come on. You don't have to just be on the football field. You could be on the sidelines. You could be in the press box. We're seeing the world change. It just didn't change as rapidly as it would like. But as long as we stick to our guns, change will take place. Yeah, but I think, I, change, think that's a, I think I think I'm sorry, Vinny. I but I still think like that door may be open, but it, it feels like sometimes the door can also be slammed shut because there's I've seen instances where there's been a person of color in a position and then that person leaves for a better opportunity or or just you know whatever the circumstances may be, yeah. leaves that position. And then that entity or that corporation hires someone that's not of color. Um, and sometimes the clientele that they're catering to, so to speak, is majority people of color. And so why don't you have that, you know, that representation? You brought up that example of NFL coaches. And sure, you know, there, there are more assistant coaches and what have you in the NFL, mm -hmm. but still you hear that dialogue being talked about, for example, that why is there still so few black head coaches or black managers in baseball or, or, or black, you know, NBA coaches, whatever, whatever the occupation may be. I feel like for me, and maybe it's because there's a slight age difference between Rennie and I, but I mean, I feel like that door has been open, but there are sometimes still instances where that door gets not closed entirely, but just kind of falls backwards a little bit or, or the progress mm -hmm. that we've made seems mm -hmm. to have stalled a bit. But Jack, yeah, I think when you, when you go into the business, go go ahead, uh, Mr. Blanton. I'm, I'm sorry. Just gonna go ahead and I get fired up. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm fired up. I feel like I'm in a BJ vice president right now. But uh, so I'm just going to say with uh, respect to what you and Jack just said. Now, I'm fewer than 10 years younger than you two, but I do believe it's a perspective thing. However, I do agree. I was going to say uh, that I think the door is swinging open, but it comes to the time that, you know, people... They feel, oh, yeah, we're good. Let's get one. But then we hear the stereotype all the time. Oh, you can't hire the crazy black guy. They're crazy, but we ain't getting another one of those. And I just found out since I left KMOV, I was talking with someone who's military and actually a Marine about a fantastic station. I knew the GM and news director. I sent a text to hey, blah, blah, blah. I talked to this person. That person said, well, I find a lot of folks are hire military people because they're afraid. They think they're PTSD. They think they're mm-hmm. crazy. They just too aggressive and I was like huh I had never thought about that but I think the pendulum goes back and forth because sometimes people want to do it they try it that person works out well it's like a unicorn then they say oh let's go back to the blonde let's go back to this pretty boy type list you know so I think it's all over the all over the place but even our industry and I'm talking about the broadcasting industry even that industry is changing you're looking at the younger folks coming up now I thought I would when I was in DC looking at radio channel seven and looking at Jim Vance and channel four I was like wow holy crap you know I thought I would never be in a position to mentor students to speak at these companies when william barr came i was the only person of well only black guy in a room with william barr i mean i thought holy crap so i think the door is swinging a little bit they get used to it but look it's about to open wide or you know what because for the first time in forever maybe the census has gone down for white people so uh uh-oh you know, they're about to have something there. I don't know if they're about to fix. Let's hire 10 Blacks at that stage. About to, I mean, Black News Channel, they're raising a the bar for us, but unfortunately, that's not going to make that huge impact. It's going to look good in that microcosm, but overall, we still have fewer than 3% Black management, even uh, a lesser amount for GM. So mm-hmm. all that's say well, that, I think it's just swinging and, back to the you're right. You're right, swinging, and, and, and to go back to where I said Band-Aid, what I mean by that is that you look at some of these positions that happen and, and, and how they put people into them. I mean, take for example, a good example here, we'll go, I'll, I'll call it an agency, a law enforcement agency here locally in St. Louis, where they had a lawsuit because this person get promoted and then they turn around and they create a diversity and inclusion and they put that person who has no experience whatsoever, except for the fact that he is gay on it. So, I mean, but that's, that was what, that's some qualifications the person had that we can see mm-hmm. and you put that person in that position and then you say oh we, we checked a box here now right that's what i'm saying it's like that's when I, and then now now it's like okay what's next and there was a lot of there was a lot of heat over that let's say there's a lot of there's a lot of hell given over that whole hiring by the um you know the society of black uh, whatever uh, society of black um police officers and everything where they put that position how they did it and how they vetted that person out so that's what i mean by that when i say that that you you you're checking a box and sometimes, and then that checking that box doesn't help the situation. I mean, even going back to like when I was when I was in at KSDK in editorial, you know, because I was one of the only black people that were making decisions. They hired a young they they had there was a young there was a younger black female that came up behind me who was not qualified, and I told her I said, "Do not do this because you're going to set us back. If you come into this and you fail, it's going to set us back." And what happened? It set us back a good, a good two three years. See, I think right now the hot thing is everyone is talking about when I mean everyone, regardless if it's the broadcasting industry or any uh, any uh, industry, you know, the hot topics right now, diversity, inclusion, uh, equality. But like Sean was saying, you know, just because it's the flavor of the month doesn't mean you only do it for a short period of time. You got to keep doing this and keep progressing and keep moving forward and keep making these um I guess if you want to call it not a mandate, but just continue to be progressive. Don't just, I, I remember during, you know, like national, you know, whatever, whatever the, whatever the month might be, you know, there's all these, you know, national Hispanic month or Asian you know, companies and all that they're highlighting. that. Okay. You highlight it for that month. Then what do you just go back to your old ways? What I mean is let's see this continue on and keep that ball rolling. 
Mm-hmm. And, I, and sometimes I just get discouraged because I don't really see that. I see them doing it for a short period of time because it's the flavor of the month, as I call it. But then you're not you're not keeping that ball rolling and progressing. You, and you, you're exactly right. Um, I'm going to pivot real fast here. So a couple things. One, to so people that are watching us and everything, if you have questions, please put them in the chat or put them on comment on Facebook. We'll, we'll start to address those as well as we're, as we're going through this. Um, I know it's a conversation between all of us here, but we want everybody included in this conversation. Um, I'm also going to pivot to, to Marco and, um, and Jack here on this one because we did get a question in about Hispanic and Asian communities support for men. Um, are there any of these out there that you guys are aware of in the St. Louis community or just in the community in general? Um, is there more family support? Is there more family of a support system group or do you guys, do you guys see supports out there? I do. I will say, and Jack, you can probably attest this more because you're, you're an Asian. I'm not, but it, t- it seems that a lot of the, the Asian families stick together and they make sure they're, that, they're, that they move each other tight knitly up to, to the ranks and what they're doing. Um, same thing with probably Latinos and, you know, um, as well. Um, I do know, like, you know, for um, being a black male in, in this world, just in, in, in St. Louis in general too, that we don't always help each other out. We wanna, it's always wanna make sure that, you know, I got that position over you. Or, you know, if you call me and said, hey, I'm up for this position and I'm, and I'm like, I like that position, I'm gonna go for it. Instead of supporting you, I'm gonna try and take you out. And that's kind of one of those things that we've kind of had happening in this community or just in general, it's just, as, just being, you know, as um, being black and, and everything. But Asian, Latino, speak on that. What do you, what do you guys have? Um, for me, uh, I definitely support all my Latinx Hispanic friends um, who are in the same field as me because I want them to succeed. But I can't say that I got the same exact like energy level from my white friend and counterparts. Most of the time, uh, I've always received criticisms um, from my classmates in college. Um, and I was primarily the only Hispanic in those classes. So I kind of had to like argue like the more diversity and inclusion viewpoint. And um, I had to do things for myself to really like put my name out there because I didn't have family connections. I didn't have like a really good like white mentors that could like connect me to things. I had to do it all on my own. And the backlash that I received kind of like bothered me a lot with my friends. Um, they would all say that I got this diversity scholarship because I am his family, because I am gay. And like trying to justify like, like the reason why I get things is because of my skin color or my heritage. And it just bothers me so much because they don't know who I am. They don't know my work ethic because I do work very hard to get to where I am. I got to Excel Business Concepts. Like I graduated during the time of COVID and I sent an email to literally every agency in St. Louis. I'm like, hey, this is my background. Uh, this is my resume. This is what I can do. And like, and Crystal loved that I came out of the blue like that. And so um, it's just, there's a lot of things that like comes with trying to pave your way, but you're always gonna get those criticisms and you're just gonna have to like look the other way because at the end of the day, like it's all on you and what you, can bring to like a company. Like never in my life did I ever think that I would end up with Twitter for this past summer, never in my life. And one thing that I do appreciate a lot about the communications team at Twitter, it's very diverse. Like the other interns were Hispanic. I've had senior managers who I've worked with who were um, Hispanic, uh, Middle Eastern and so many others. Uh, And I saw a true reflection on the workplace environment that I do wanna work with and the people that are in it. So uh, yeah, that's hopefully that like answered your question, Sean. I don't know, Sean, for for, for me, for me, I I feel like I've always had to work harder than anyone else because in my case, I feel like I'm representing, uh, you know, all Asians when I'm doing what I do, regardless of whether it's in communications PR or whether it's in my past life in broadcasting, because uh, I don't know about, Vinny and, and Rennie, you know, talk about the markets they worked at, but, you know, every market I worked at, I was the only Asian. I was, in, in some cases, the only minority in that newsroom in terms of an on-air personality. Um, you know, I can recall, like Marco was talking about growing up in Arkansas, I remember the very first day I started in Springfield, Missouri at KYTV, um, they sent me down to Harrison, Arkansas to cover a story. 
And I vividly remember before I walked out the door, um, the assignment editor says to me, hey, by the way, a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan lives down in Harrison where you're going to, but don't worry, you'll be all right because you know, you've got a, a photographer with you. So, so for me, I just feel like wherever I've gone, I felt like I've had to work harder than anybody else. Um, maybe I feel like I have to prove myself more than anyone else, even though I've got all of this experience now. And I can honestly also tell you there, there's been instances as well where I've been runner up for jobs and in one way, shape or form, they alluded to the fact that I didn't get the job, even though I was more qualified because I didn't fit uh, whatever specification they were looking for. Um, so th that can happen too, but I just feel like for me, um, yeah, the Asian community is a pretty tight knit group, but I, I feel like I can fit in with anyone. But the most important thing to me is I feel like I have to outwork, out hustle everybody just because I am a person of color. And I don't know how anyone else in the panel feels about that. Sean, let me add to that a little bit. Uh, Jack, what I'll say to you, there have been a couple of times, a couple of markets where I was the first black reporter. I'm like, wow, I only started the reporting career in 2003. I was the first black reporter at the CBS station in Charlottesville, Virginia. Now, granted, we had a mix. We had our Asian, we had our Puerto Ricans, we had our whites, we had the older guy, we had, uh, you know, it was a nice mix, but it was like, oh my gosh, you know, now the other stations had blacks, but us, we were the first one. But I did want to uh, talk to Marco, uh, Marco. Uh, Stay encouraged, brother. You know, don't don't be discouraged. Uh, you have to always fight. You have to always push. I will tell you, I can only speak from experience at Camo and Shaw. I think you know about this already. You might know, uh, but they don't have a black manager in the building. We were so happy when I was there. Uh, I've only been gone about a year. We had a black HR director. Well, he just left a couple of months ago for a better paying gig. So even in a market that's so diverse as this. It's like, wow, who's sitting at the table? And as we talk about these challenges, I can't ignore the fact that sometimes, at least for people like me, it helps because I don't, some of you guys, I don't mind walking into a room saying, hey, what's going on? I used to always walk into my GM's office, always walk into the news director's office. To this day, some of them even reach out to me on Twitter to ask a question about something in this community to give some insight. So I think it's incumbent upon us when we are in these positions, or even if you are not in that position, that you make your voice heard. You have got to speak up because the people behind us are looking to us to do it. So many times, I mean, I... I guess I'm experienced, I know what I'm doing, but there were some markets where I didn't think I was really that cool. But by golly, they counted on me. I was at everything. So when we are in these roles, we have got to speak up. If you don't know, talk to people in other markets, get some insight, talk to the older folks, talk to the younger folks and find out what interests them, get involved in the community. But when I moved here in St. Louis, it was about one month in, the boss was like, Oh my God, how did you do that? And I was like, I just walked up to the people, say, hey, blah, blah, blah. You know, for some of us, we can play our hood card a little bit. I'm from Chicago, so I do how to talk in some parts. Other times I have to be able to do, well, hi, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, code switching. <laughs> don't don't be afraid to use what you got to get what we need to get for others. So that's all I got. Yeah, huh, exactly right. So we got we do have a question coming in. Um, so keep elaborating on this this question that's coming in is basically what do you what do you think your influence can be in communications and PR as far as you know a speed of color what do you what do you think your influence in this community can be for the for let's, let's go with, we'll go with the public relations side of it we can go with the TV side of it still too because we you know, we're all journalists here as well um Marco since you're the the rookie of the group what do you feel coming up I mean your generation what do you feel that your influence can be on coming in on on and the, and, you know, in the PR community here in St. Louis. Yes. So one of my biggest goals um, in life, in my career, in communication and marketing, is to fully explain what I do to my parents and for them to understand what I do. Uh, my parents grew up very um, Hispanic, very Mexican. They don't know what I'm doing. Like, they don't understand what I'm doing in this field. Um, I had a pre-law track background in college, uh, and I was involved in debate. And so my parents saw me as a lawyer, but now they don't understand what I'm doing right now. So I think for me, for my uh, like give back to the community is to really like show like I am Hispanic, but like 
as somebody who grew up in a first generation immigrant home, like you can make it anywhere. Like my parents didn't know anybody. My, my dad's a landscaper, my mom's a housekeeper. Um, they don't have like notable, like, like higher up jobs, but my parents worked very hard to like push me to go for what I want. And essentially that's what I'm doing in life. It's going for what I want. Um, and like making a positive impact and going to the beat of my drum. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, you definitely do that. I can tell you, because I, I do work with Marco on, uh, on some projects and, and I, I do know Marco's story as well as his, his dad being a landscaper and, and coming up. So um, yeah, and, and Marco being from Arkansas too is kind of a rarity as well, because you know, you don't see a lot of Latinos from yeah. Arkansas. I'm, I'm literally the only one in my family, my entire family, like cousins, like uncles and aunts. I moved out of the state that I grew up in. Everyone stayed. I left. And I did that for me because I saw more opportunities for myself in other states than in Arkansas. And so, um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Yeah. Um... Vinny, Jack, and you know, Vinny, step in on this one. I mean, what do you feel your influence is? I mean, my influence is pretty much the same as it's always been in every newsroom that I've worked. Um, is to if you guys bold, you know, sometimes you can bowl a strike without the uh, things up. Do you call them the gutter? It's not the gutter, but the uh, that the, the the barricade thing, the, whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about. What I want to do, I want to always make sure that we the people of color in these positions, whether it's TV, PR, whatever, we are those keeping that ball on track to make sure that we hit a strike. Because if we are not there doing it, we're not, you can say we're diverse all you want. If you don't have the people making a decision being diverse, it ain't gonna matter because we're not gonna understand, wow, this is affecting North County differently than it is affecting people in South County or you're not gonna able to be articulate or tell or even understand that story. And for the reporters in the room, you know you can't have an effective live shot or tell a good package or write a good package if you don't quite understand the news in front of you. So that's my goal. That's always my wish, and whether it's a newsroom, whether it's at this office, where we're um, running these cases on people. With 99%, I haven't counted, but 99% of them are black people, uh, probably an even higher percentage are Black people who dropped out of school. And it's like, I think it's incumbent upon us to step up and have a seat at the table. Unfortunately, many of us don't even know where the table is. Mm -hmm. well, very, very, very true. Rennie, uh, let's say you're about to jump in. Oh, well, you know, when I look at the influences that you could have on people, I always look at influences at different levels. Influences to the, those who are younger than me is that, hey, look, I'm here. You could be here. But being here is not an easy job. You're not just going to be given this job. And if you do get this job, you need to prove yourself on the job. But you should always have that. You should always strive to be the best at whatever it is you're doing. You know, why just settle for, hey, I'm on the team. I'm going to ride the bench. If you could be the superstar, if you could lead the team to the championship. So as a former athlete, I always view everything in life in those terms, especially when it comes to motivating the people who are younger than me. When it comes to my peers and those alongside me, I want to open up their eyes to other experiences from my point of view. Let you know that there's a lot of great stories on the other side of town if you just go and seek them out. There's a whole community there that wants to be recognized for something more than, well, that's where all the shootings take place or that's the rough side of town. There's a lot of great stories over there from people who don't want to leave there because that's their community. That's where they grew up. Those are their people. That's where they feel comfortable. So go meet them, go understand them and, and realize that your outside perception of them is the way some people view the rest of us as well. So as you show a prejudice towards a certain side of town, there's people who show that same thing towards you, even though you may live on the great side of town. Mm -hmm. And then to the people who are above me, you know, the, the mentors and, and the ones in corporations and all this, I think the example you want to show to them is that, hey, look, you need to open your eyes up to the world. You need to see that there's more to it than just you and your ivory tower, that there are everyday people doing everyday things, and you need these people to be a part of your lives. And you need to also become more active in the community yourself. Come down from the higher ups and get on the ground and shake hands and dig holes and understand that if those people see you, 
if they can see your light, they will use that light as their own personal guide to go on to bigger and better things for themselves. You know, not everybody's cut out to be the greatest of all, t- the greatest of all times. Yet everybody's cut out with the opportunities and the abilities to be that person. You just have to find the right fit and the right thing for you. And I think one of the things coming out of the pandemic has showed us is that it is about my own personal mental health and worth. And what am I worth to other people? And I can't spend my entire life trying to prove myself to everybody out there. So that's why it's important to also understand that, you know, maybe that business isn't the business for me. Maybe being in journalism works for me because I've always done it. It it kind of suits who I am, but it's not necessarily a fit for everybody involved. And find that niche, find that thing that works for you. So that's that's the type of influence I want to give the people. I want to be that, that motivational factor for not just change, but change and understanding. Um, because right now we're having change, but as we've been talking about this whole time, a lot of that change is forced. We don't necessarily have the understanding. We have the people that say, okay, open the door because, well, we need more people in here, but why do we need those people in here? Stop and take a look at why those people need to be there. The stories that need to be told, the point of views that need to be respected. And, and I'm going to jump in on Renny Hero again. I'm going to go back to him real fast on this because... Something that came back from when, uh, our past that um, we worked together. One thing, I remember sitting in, in the uh, sports office with you, and I remember just looking at your face a couple of days when, when you first got here. I, I was there mm-hmm. when you made the I was there when made the announcement that you were coming to town, and I saw the reaction from from at the time our peers who weren't really necessarily welcoming for you because they had mm-hmm. a they had a, a mindset of this is the person that they thought was going to get this job, and and then they bring you in and surprise everybody. And the reactions that came out of that newsroom, but then just sitting in that newsroom, sitting in the sports office with you, just many nights, just you know, just kind of just just get to know you. One thing I noticed about the sports world, when you were in the sports world, the one thing that you were always getting, you I'm not gonna say you were getting shut out, but they didn't know who you were. And I remember mm-hmm. going back to the NCAA. We were sitting there, the final four was here, and you brought in Michael Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser to do to, to be on Sports Plus. And then I remember you're sitting in the room at the press conference and a couple of the people nationally recognized and said, Hey, Rennie, but it's not, and they called you out by name. And I'm not going to call out the, the journalists that, that were, were shocked, but there were quite a few in that room that were shocked. They didn't know who you were and the influence that you had and who you, and who you knew the, the respect that you carried in this, in this business. And that's a, that was something to me to listen to you tell that story and how it changed things for that mm-hmm. whole dynamic of who you were, because St. Louis has a, you know, a, a if, if you're not a Cardinal fan or if you're not Blues, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, don't, you don't know anything. But you mm-hmm. you have a very dynamic sports background. And oh, that yeah. was one thing that was that – was, that was one thing that just – that that the way they shut him out was kind of – I'm going to say not to use the word racist, but kind of – it kind of was a, was a, was a way no, of – No, you know what it was? It was club. I wasn't a part of the club. I the wasn't club. from yes, here. Good old didn't boys, know yes. me. And so who's this guy coming here? Who do you think he is? And, you know, for a person who didn't believe in themselves, I'm not saying cocky or confidence or anything like that, but just had that belief in yourself to endure and push forward, I probably would have folded and left. And trust me, there were many a days within the first five years, I was like, I, I can't do this. I've been here now for 17 years. And I think that's because I believe in myself. And I know what I've done and where I've been and who I've talked to. You know, I've, I've talked to presidents. I, I chill down and just talk to George Bush like he was just another guy you know I, I've been to Super Bowls and World Series and all-star games and the Pro Bowl and I've had chats with Michael Jordan hey one night I sat in a in the Grand Havana room after the Bulls beat the Bullets in the NBA playoffs and there's Scottie Pippen with a cigar there's Michael with a cigar there's Charles Oakley with a cigar you know what there's Rennie with a cigar. So I've been to these places that I've done these things. I don't sit there and go, oh, I got to prove myself to these guys. I've got to prove myself to me. I got to prove myself to my family. And my dad taught me a long time ago, not from any words that he said or anything like that, just from watching his work ethic. A guy that was in management at United Parcel Service who would still get out of his suit put on his browns during the Christmas season and drive the truck around and deliver packages because that's the job that had to be done. He didn't care that somebody was thinking that, oh, I I thought you were management. Oh, I guess you're not good enough for management. No, there's a job that needs to be done. And if you don't believe that you can do that job, then you need to step out. And I've always felt like I could do what I do. And the main thing is not lose sight of who I am. 
and become somebody else just to make others happy. So I wasn't going to fold and shuffle off and bow down to people and go, yes, sir, yes, sir. And just so I could be at the boys club, I was going to be me, you know, eventually it's either all going to work out or I'll find a place somewhere else. Um, like I always tell people every time they ask me, how can you wake up at midnight every morning? I said, because I have a family to feed and I got bills to pay. And that's my major focus, you know, and as long as I'm doing that, I'm happy and I'm pleased. Yeah. So Jack, not to, not to cut you off. I was, uh, I want to tie him and get ready to say a little bit more about his, his journey here and stuff like that. And because and, and, <laughs> that, well, that, and honestly with, with, with that, what you, what you just said, that inspired me because I was, I was a producer. I was still coming up and everything, but to see you fight through that and to yeah. watch that firsthand yeah. was something that was like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not about to feel about this either. And, but, you know, and it, it kept, it kept, it helped me with my drive and keeping, you know, right. moving forward. But you know so, what, Sean, in, in my battles and, and things like that to get to where I am today, there's many people who came long before me who fought much harder with much more adverse adversities against them that in many ways I've got it on easy street because of what they've done. And so because of what I've done, hopefully someone behind me has an even easier path to follow because maybe someone could say, Hey, he could be the next guy that did this. I mean, look at our holiday, you know, look at the people around us who have achieved uh, Julius Hunter. It's not like the door isn't open. It's just that when you do open it, you've got to make sure that there's somebody behind you, a couple of more that they get the opportunity to come through too. But if you fold to the pressure, it's like, aha, see, told you they couldn't handle it. See, mm -hmm. look, we were right. You yeah. can't let that happen. So true. So Jack, you, uh, what, you, what, you what do you feel your influence is or what you can offer? You know, for me, it's it, it, it's been harder because I didn't have, you know, someone I couldn't see someone that was uh, of my ethnic background that I could, you know, really look at as an idol or as a mentor. And so for me, I think uh, it was just kind of like what Rennie was saying earlier about, you know, I'm doing these things for me. You know, maybe the worth ethic was taught by my parents, not so much in what they said, but what in more in what they uh what they did because they were self-employed business owners. Um, but I think Rennie is right. All these things that we do uh, and continue to do to this day, we have to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves uh, or for our families or, or for our loved ones. And so um, that's the way I kind of carry myself every day is just uh, carry myself in that, in that way and think, uh, you know, is this what my dad would have done? Uh, is this what my mom would have done? And just always handle yourself in the correct and in the right way and let the chips fall where they may because um you know and i hate to use that analogy or that saying but at the end of the day you know all you can do is do your best and um and control what you can control and and go from there and that's kind of the way i live my life kind of in both professionally and personally yeah i mean that's 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 a good way to you know to keep it moving forward so um, again, I'm asked, we're, we're open for any questions here. Um, we're about to wrap up here shortly and, uh, you know, love to hear from anybody in the audience that has any questions. You know, one question did come up uh, while we were talking is, um, do we feel that, oh, well, two questions have popped in on. Um, the first question that came in was, do we feel that, there's, that systemic racism or institutional racism is still relevant in St. Louis business world? I think we kind of touched on that a little bit with our stories, but, um, just a quick, you know, from, from everyone, what do you, do you, how do you feel? Do you feel that's still something that's really existing here? Yeah, I, you know, me personally, I think that, that with everything that's happened with George Floyd again and everything mm -hmm. that's been going on with the BLM <laughs> movement lately, that some of those walls are starting to break down. But go ahead. Yeah. And, um, well, you know, I see a lot of uh, young people now opening up their own little retail shops. Uh, I see it on Wash Avenue. I see it in the mall. I see it on Cherokee Street. I'm seeing people seize opportunities and maybe they're they're riding the wave of hey people are seeing this this discrepancy in the world and they want to make a difference i'll give this kid an opportunity to open up his own shop but once that shop is open it's up to you to keep it running it's up to you to be successful so yes there there are um difficulties and ladders and things like that obstacles to overcome and climb in order for you to be successful in order for you to 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 have your path but I, I do believe that it is available to you. 
Um, but you've got to have that want, that desire, that drive and determination. It, a lot of it is on you. If, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. That's what my mother used to always tell me. And so if this achievement at life that you really dream of and really want is going to happen, you have got to beat down the path to make it happen. You just cannot allow things to stand in your way. It ain't going to be easy. It ain't going to be easy. But if you go ahead and say, well, too hard for me and walk away, then are you really trying to beat down the walls of systemic racism or are you just continuing to let them stand? Yeah, and as for me, I don't know if it's systemic racism here. I compare the St. Louis market to the Charleston market. They didn't care whether you were Black, white, or Asian. If you were not from there, they did not like you. So I consider St. Louis to be more uh, provincial. Also, I will say it's probably more implicit bias rather than racism, but I don't know. That's a delicate thing there. But that's my take on it. I think some people here just don't know. And if you've only been mm -hmm. here, I talk to people, especially in the dating world, it's like, oh, I, I, I've been to uh, Springfield. Oh, I've been across the river. Oh, I've been to Lake of the Ozarks. I'm like, some people have not gone more than two hours out of St. Louis. And I'm thinking, uh -huh. wow. So to me, I think it's just the culture. People are not aware or educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we did. I have. I mean, if anybody else wants to comment, I just, we had another question that actually came in directed at uh, something that Rennie said. Somebody, um, somebody near and dear to all, all of our hearts, um, mm -hmm. Erica Van Ross, who was on the uh, the women's panel. I'm going to call her out. She hey. um, she wanted to um, she wanted to go into more on you know she you said something about opening the doors for uh, for others to make sure they can walk through. How do we feel? And I think we've been touching this as we as we've been talking. How do we feel about that? Are we doing enough of that? Are we, you know, are we, are we, you know, do we need to do more of it? Is there is there, is there more yeah. we need to get out in the community? Well, um, I, I I think a lot of that uh, uh, is a matter of those kids, those teachers, those educators saying to us, "Hey, can you come out and talk to my my class? Hey, can you come meet with my group?" Can you shed some light on what it takes to do what you do or why what you do is, is important to you? And, and maybe some other kids might be inspired to come along with you. I'll tell you right now, it's, it's difficult with the workload to just go, you know what? I'm going to take the day and I'm going to just go somewhere and meet some people. Uh, a lot of people I meet when I do stuff with the Boys and Girls Club and things like this, the kids will come up and we sit and we have a conversation, very open and honest with them about what I do and why I do it. Um, but it's almost like the people who can facilitate that, the bridge between them and me, if they reach out and say, hey, can you come and talk to my class or, you know, do something with this? I'm more than happy to do those things. It's just that I don't get those requests very often. You know, the requests I get are usually for big charity events or something like that. But I would love to go in the classrooms and talk to kids and, and meet with different groups just to give them an understanding of you know, what's going on in our world and why what I do and what we do as a media can be world changing if done in the right way and done openly enough. Yeah, it takes a lot of, uh, and I think uh, part of the question was also how do we find balance? As for me, uh, I make sure that I have mentors. I make sure that I talk to people who like a season that. Then I also make sure at NABJ I'm touching everybody's hands i'm talking i'm following them on twitter and then you have to for some of us and maybe uh jack and uh, ready with the more experience we have to watch our ego because after a while you know they start to raise you on the pedestal you're this part mm -hmm. you're out of your kick and it's like yeah everywhere you go i mean sometimes i still walk around i've been gone out of tv for a year and a week now a year two weeks whatever every day somebody's like i hadn't seen you on show before where you been i'm like oh i've been off I don't want to yeah. say I've been talking for a year. People <laughs> think they just miss you, but I think you do have to, it's a work-life balance. That's the best thing about the change for me. I miss some of the things, but the work-life balance is real. But you have to stay grounded. You have to talk to people. And that's with anything. I don't care if you're black, white, or whatever. It shouldn't be the type that propels you to move in life. It should be about your purpose, uh, and I think my purpose is, you know, impacting others, making people wow them, whatever way it is, whether it's shaking their head or whether it's telling them something or giving them a hug. But I think I always try to affect change that way. And I stay balanced by killing the ego. It's been work, yeah. but, you know, it happens. 
Yeah, it's yeah. funny you mentioned uh, that uh, about the ego part. And I always felt like it was important never to have an ego. Yeah, you can be put on a pedestal because you're on the air and people recognize you and all that. And I mean, I genuinely liked that because that meant they were watching you. But I never had an ego about it because I always remember, too, the key thing, too. If they don't like you, they can turn the channel. They don't have to watch you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so mm-hmm. I always have been very mindful of that. And that's even carried over to me now where I do what I do in communications PR because we're communicating, we're talking to the public, we're talking to whichever one of your, uh, your key audience or your stakeholders are. And so, um, and that's why I came back to MoDA. You talk about work-life balance and that's one of the key things as I get older and older that becomes more of a priority for me. Do I miss that breaking news rush in the old days? Absolutely. That juice, that adrenaline, certainly. I mean, but I can say honestly with what I do and some of the places I've worked at, I still get those adrenaline rushes because we'll get those crisis communications or those things that come up at the last minute. So for me, it's always about uh, being who I am. But for me also too, that question about uh, paving it forward for the next for the next generation, for the next group, I'm like ready. I would more be more than happy to go talk with young people, to talk to people that are interested in PR or communications or even like, you know, how, how was my journey in broadcasting, for example, and then how did I make the transition over all that type of stuff? You know, if people are curious about it or interested in it, and you don't have to be of, of an Asian descent to, to ask me, you can be anybody. I don't care. I'll talk to anybody about my journey and, and where it began and where it's taken me and where I am now, because I've gotten to experience a lot of great things and then i've also got to experience a lot of bad things both good and bad both in news and in sports and in communications and pr and i think all that has shaped me and made me who i am but i'm always willing to pay it forward in terms of talking to whoever is interested in wanting to sit down and talk with me over as Rennie said over a cigar over a, a drink or whatever the whatever the social situation is it doesn't matter to me i'll I'll talk to anybody um, about my journey and how to pay it forward and how to help you if you need any help. I mean, I truly am one of those. Like, for example, right now, uh, some people are out of jobs. I truly am trying to help people find jobs. It's not just, you know, you hear people like, oh, let me know if you need any help with anything. And then you never hear anything. No, I'm not like that. I'm truly trying to make an effort to help whoever it is that needs to find a, a better occupation or a, a stepping stone, or if they need some guidance or advice about an occupation or an industry, or, you know, hey, what was it like working at such and such place? I mean, I'll be brutally honest and let you know the pros and cons of all that. We, hmm? we know you don't smoke cigars, so stop it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there are pros and cons to everything out there. It, it's, it's a matter of, are you willing to stick to it? And that's why the work-life balance and your own mental health is so important right now because there's one thing that we need in life and that is a feeling of appreciation. And when we don't feel appreciated, that's when you have the world around you happening the way it is happening around you. People out there, no matter what walk of life they're in, feel unappreciated and they've had enough. Uh, Mm -hmm. You're seeing a lot of people not going back to work after, you know, being at home during the pandemic and things like this. And everybody wants to rant and rave and go, well, that's because the government's paying them too much money, maybe for some. But for a lot of people, they realize, you know what, why do I want to go into that nine to five where no one cares? No one knows my name. I sit at a cubicle and I, I hack away. There is this balance in life. And so you have to realize there's good and bad pros and cons. You know, I told you earlier, I wake up at midnight. And I come to work. I, I sit at this desk starting at 1 a.m. And here it is 12, 18, and I'm still sitting at this desk with work to do. But that's the life I chose. And that's what comes along with it. There are sacrifices. And because you make those sacrifices, sometimes you are able to achieve heights that others may have thought that you weren't capable of reaching. Um, and that's why when, I, when people talk to me about races and things like that, yeah, I understand it. And the only way I know to overcome it is to, is to just keep pushing forward. Because if you don't push forward and give up, who's left? Yeah, hey, let's lead the charge. Lead the charge. No, change exactly. Is, change is coming. Change is, <laughs> coming. Change is, it's change already is here. here. Yeah, it's you here. Know? I mean, it's not just coming. So, Marco, uh, rookie, you know, I always like to play the rookie. You want to you <laughs> you you close this out and bring it home for us? I mean, what do you, yeah. you're, you're the young and coming up here. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
as long as like the programs for all the initiatives to try to increase like awareness or trying to get the door open, as long as those programs are consistent, like then I feel like we will be getting to a generation where a lot more people feel included within trying to get within the industry. I've, I've had um, the honor to have been to different programs that I got to see like the media entertainment industry. I've got to see like, uh, like gaming, sports, um, and these type of programs are like from nonprofits who really care about like trying to get people to be included within the table. So like, I'm talking about like the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, the National Communication Association, Peers SA is a really good one um, um, and others. So um, yeah, as long as those programs are consistent, like I feel like we're gonna be getting there with the generation that I'm in currently. As long as they make sense, like, um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I love how you close. Yeah. So, in a word. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> in a word. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, so we could keep going. We've uh, we've gone over our time in UTV. People know that we are five minutes over our time, and I've been like, getting the rap. I've been getting the rap sign for like the last like six minutes. So <laughs> you know, you know, we're about to get cut off. But um, no, this this is this has been very very good. I know um, that we were talking about bringing in another doing this again in another couple of months, having another panel and um, um, bringing it, taking it more on a regional scale um, to open it up to our Midwestern chapter. So that's something that we're looking to, to do. This discussion has been great. I mean, it's, it's, you know, one for me, it's, it's, it, I told you it's real near, dear, near, real near and dear to my heart because, you know, I've known Renny for years. I've known, known Jack and I've known, uh, you know, Vinny for almost about the same amount of time, you know, 20 plus years. Well, it's a long time. So, um, but yeah, just, uh, I just want to go ahead and wrap it up and say, hey, thank you for thank you for the conversation, thank you for the insight, the advice. I know our, our audience, you know, enjoyed it and just as much as I did. And um, you know, again, I just try to keep the keep the uh, the process moving. So, in closing, um, this is again PRSA St. Louis Chapters um, Men of Color. It's actually the Color Communications Part Two, the Men of Color, because we did have a Woman of Color one a couple months ago, and that one was awesome as well too. Um, Again, PRSA, St. Louis, you know, we can follow us on Facebook, follow us on, on Twitter, you know, our YouTube channel as well. If you want to be a member, you can definitely reach out, go to prsa.stl.org to the website. And, um, you know, we'd be happy to, happy to have you and keep the conversation going. I mean, again, it has to end sometime and that time has come. So I thank all of you for uh, joining us and, and doing this and being a part of this. Thank you, Sean. Thank all you. right, appreciate it. Thanks. All right, Thanks, Sean. Good okay. to see all you guys. It was nice to meet everyone again. See y'all later.